In this section, we will be going over property rights. When selling property, you have to understand what is being sold. In this class, we focus on selling two different kinds of property, real property and personal property. Real property is the land, anything attached to the land, and all of the various rights associated with the ownership of the land. You'll also see real property referred to as real estate, realty, or immovable property. Note that these terms are not strictly interchangeable. Real property refers to both the land and the bundle of rights associated with it, while real estate, realty, and immovable property refer to just the land and all of the property attached to it. That said, the distinction between these terms is not hugely important in practice as an agent, and the exam will often use them interchangeably. Ownership of real property is transferred or conveyed using a deed. Deeds get complicated. For the time being, think of them as the receipt for real estate. Transferring ownership, legal title, to real estate is known as granting title. When talking about giving and receiving something, the person with the suffix or is the one giving, and the person with the suffix e is the one receiving. So the grantor gives the deed to the grantee. Ownership of real estate is a bundle of rights. It is not single right of ownership. The bundle of rights is a grouping of property rights that can be separately transferred. The rights included in the bundle of rights are possession, exclusion, control, disposition, and enjoyment. These rights let you do different things with your real estate. For example, you could own real estate possession Use the control of it, control. Use it in any legal way, enjoyment. Limit access to it, exclusion. Or give it to someone else by sale, rental, or in your own will, disposition. When you think about real estate and the different things the bundle of rights allows you to do with it, also remember that real estate does not exist in a flat vacuum. It extends up and down and connects to other pieces of real estate. That means you need to clearly define your real property. It might include land and surface rights. The land is the surface of the earth. Lands rights, rights to the land's surface are known as surface rights and often extend approximately 30 feet below the land's surface. Improvements on the land. Improvements are anything that is permanently attached, either directly or indirectly, to the land. For example, a house is an improvement. Individual improvements attached to the property, for example, window blinds, are sometimes referred to as fixtures. Air rights and mineral rights. Air and mineral rights are the rights to the space above and below the land, along with any natural resources, such as oil, precious metals, etc. They are vertical interests and may be sold or leased separately from the surface rights. Solid mineral rights are solid minerals and liquid mineral rights are oil, gas, etc. Okay. In many states, the landowner does not own the liquid mineral rights. Instead, the landowner has the right to capture them under the doctrine of capture. Other states use utilization pooling, where the landowner does own a fraction of whatever liquid mineral rights exist under their property. Historically, air rights, or air lots, and mineral rights, or subsurface rights, were governed by the principle of culé et solon et usque et clem et ad infernos, Latin for 
Whoever's is the soil, it is theirs all the way to heaven and all the way to hell. However, air rights changed with the advent of airplanes in the court case United States versus Cosby. Now the space starting somewhere between 800 and 5 now the space starting somewhere between 80 and 500 feet above the land is called navigable airspace and is under the jurisdiction of the Federal Aviation Authority. Mineral rights extend to the Earth's core. If mineral rights are purchased separately from the surface of the land, the owner of the mineral rights automatically gains the right to harvest the minerals as an implied easement known as profit upon her. Riparian rights. Riparian rights are the ownership rights for landowners whose property borders a river or other waterway. Uh, property bordering a navigable river have the right up to the properties bordering a navigable river have rights up to the accreditation line edge of the water and properties bordering non-navigable rivers have rights to the midpoint of the water not all states use riparian rights to define the ownership rights of properties adjoining rivers and waterways. Water rights in western states are usually determined by the doctrine of prior appropriation, which bases ownership on whoever used the water first. Eastern states, all of the 13 colonies including Massachusetts, usually use riparianism or riparian rights. Literal rights. Literal rights are the ownership rights of property bordering lakes and oceans. These properties own all of the land up to the accreditation line. Edge of water, most often meaning high tide line in most states. In Massachusetts, literal rights work a bit differently. As defined in the colonial ordinances of 1641 through 1647, Literal rights in Massachusetts extend to the mean high water line from to the mean low water line, or a hundred rods, meaning 1,650 feet from the mean high water line, which is whichever is less. Oh God! I'll read that again. <clears throat> As defined in the colonial ordinances of 1641 through 1647, literal rights in Massachusetts extend from the mean high water line to the mean low water line, or 100 rods. From the mean high water line, which is what. That's not a sentence. As defined in the colonial ordinances of 1641 through 1647, literal rights in Massachusetts extend from the mean high water line to the mean low water line, whichever is less. The public has an easement or right of access over the land between the high and low water lines, known as tidal flats, for the purpose of navigation, fishing, fouling, and passing freely over and through the water. Appurtenances. An appurtenance is any property right or item that is attached to the land, which exists outside the boundaries of the property itself. An easement, right of way, across an adjoining property for beach access, in-ground pool, mailbox, or a deeded parking spot in a condominium building are appurtenant to the land. Personal property. Personal property is any property that is not attached to a piece of land 
and not attached to any improvement on that land. Example, a car or a table. It is also called personal personality, chattel, or movable property, and is transferred via a bill of sale, meaning the fancy term for a receipt. Differentiating between personal and real property. Usually it's obvious if something is personal or real property, but some situations can get a bit more complicated. For those complicated situations, there are four tests you can use to find out if the property is personal or real. These tests are important to know because all of those ways of defining your, your real property that we talked about are above talked about above are included by default when you sell your real estate. This sounds obvious, but it can catch people off guard. The tests are attachment, adaptability, intention, and agreement. Attachment, whether or not the property is permanently attached, for example, by nails or roots to the land. Adaptability, whether the property is custom built to fit or generically fits anywhere. Intention. The intention of the person who installed the property, i.e., did they want to make the property permanent? Agreement. The buyer and seller of a piece of property can agree to treat a piece of property as either personal or real. This overrides the other tests. Watch out for the statute of frauds, the law requiring that real estate contracts to be in writing in order to be legally enforceable. Watch out for the statute of frauds. All items of real estate are included in a home sale unless specifically excluded in writing. Real estate agents should talk to buyers and sellers of real estate to discover what if any property should be specifically included or excluded in the sale. Intention is the most important of these tests because it creates two exceptions to these rules. Trade fixtures. Items of business property that are somehow permanently attached to the land but are treated as personal property because they were only installed for the use of one particular business. This is particularly a concern with commercial tenants and is often outlined in their lease to avoid disputes. Emblements. Crops that are planted and harvest annually or biannually, like corn or wheat. Plants are usually real estate since they're literally growing in the land, but emblements are treated as personal property because they are not intended to be permanent and are only planted to be harvested. Note that permanent plants like apple trees or vineyards do not qualify as emblems and are treated as real estate. Changing property types. The category of real and personal property are fundamentally mutable, meaning that you may freely move items of property between them. So as so, the categories of real and personal property are fundamentally mutable, meaning that you may freely move items of property between them so long as there is no agreement preventing you from doing so. For example, a purchase and sales agreement. The terms for moving between categories are annexation, when a property was personal and is now re, for example, planting a sapling, and severance, when a property was real and is now personal, for example, digging up a tree.